Well, good afternoon and welcome everybody to Business Insights Network online. This is our, our opportunity to meet with everybody once a month, first Wednesday in the month at two o'clock in the afternoon. It follows on the international side of what we do with county business shows um, and the network was originally a response to um, the pandemic when we couldn't do the Gloucestershire Business Show. We put things online and suddenly we had lots of international interest uh, and friends and we've ended up with international partners all over the place. Um, today we're looking at cyber and the world for micro and SME businesses. Now what we try and do with Business Insights is we, we try and come at this from a slightly different angle. We, you know, cyber is a very big part of all our worlds at the, at the moment as we all know and I think you know there's a lot of information and that's good and a lot of good people trading out there and I think um, you know if you need basic information about cyber then there's lots of places you can go um, but what we want to do is create a dynamic. Um, I mentioned a moment ago that Business Insights uh, became as a response at the beginning of the pandemic and we had lots of international partners. And I've got two guests today who are going to partake in this interview. Um, one is Paul Croker from 18IT who um, works with us as a partner uh, based I think in Portishead or in Bristol area, but I'll let Paul do that in a, properly in a minute, um, who curates with us all our content all year round um, and has the diverse challenges of making it as relevant relevant to a pet shop on the high street in Western Supermare as it is to a business in Hub 8 in Cheltenham. Um, for those of you who've got background in it, you'll understand that there's a very different set of businesses. Um, so that's Paul. I'll let Paul introduce himself in a moment. And then uh, those of you, uh, if you look around the screen, you'll see a chap called Steve Simmons, who uh, rather wonderfully is sat, I, I'm, I'm expecting to hear that he's sat in the middle of Johannesburg today, but you never quite know on Zoom. But that's where he lives. Steve runs, uh, well not runs, he's, he's an associate with and works with an organisation called Wolfpack Risk who um, look at cyber security in South Africa and across Pan Africa. Um, and we're really interesting to see what, what's going on with the micro and SME world there. So this, this next 20 minutes or so um, is going to be about just I've got some questions I'm going to lob at both of them and uh, we're just going to get a bit of a comparison about the two different environments you're working in. So um, before we go any further, Paul, do you, would you like to just kind of say hello on your own behalf? Um, I've stolen your thunder. Over to you. Thank you, Pete. Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Croker. I'm the owner founder of a company called 18 IT. We are uh, IT directors for small businesses looking at their IT strategy to making sure their IT is good for them and what their needs are and delivers against their business plan. Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. And um, much the same to Steve. Do you want to just introduce yourself properly and correct all the errors that I've just made, guessing a little bit on what's going on in your world? Yeah, hi, everybody. Steve Simmons. And you're right, I am in Johannesburg at the moment. Uh, still working from the same place. Uh, not travelling a lot at the moment. Uh, we do have power cuts on and off all day long, so luckily it only goes off at four, so it should be okay. But yes, I do have a business called Synergy that I manage with a partner, and I work with also a company called Wolfpack Information Risk, where we work with cyber security risk and those sorts of things. So it's great to be back, and I know some of the faces already there, and I see new ones too, so thank you very much. Fantastic. And um, we do emphasise the, you know, do connect, do, do say hello to each other. You've got a contact list and apologies to those who came in late and haven't managed to work their way onto the contact list. But if you, uh, I can, I can get you circulated later. Um, so I've got a list of questions that are in that are in my mind. I, I have the joy when we do all this sort of stuff that I get enough involved in many people's businesses to be dangerous. And I have to remind people a lot of the time that that's not my specialism. My, my specialism background actually is the entertainment industry and music and festivals and things. Um, but I do find myself um, quite involved in conversations in and around cyber. And one of the things that we've been working on with the shows just recently is is that increasing threat landscape that's going on in in cyber in general um businesses get busier we've had the pandemic's just seen an explosion in in the whole cyber thing um and there's a sort of a position that that we adopt that says look when when you're dealing either with cyber specific companies or companies over a specific size they've got the resource the skill and the background to kind of cover their backs and and you know if they get into trouble then they should have known better but the bulk of the uh, business world was something like 83% as far as I'm aware is from the micro and SME world and they don't have a necessarily an automatic background in cyber. You've got people and sole traders trying to sole trade and make an, a living and cyber becomes just another 
overhead at the same time as the cyber criminals are getting cleverer and bigger and uglier <coughs> and more capable of pulling more stunts. So we're looking at, <coughs> pardon me, over the coming shows to actually build a message and build a set of discussions uh, with Paul and his team um, uh, to, to, to allow cyber to be accessible as an understanding and conversation. So um, I think lobbying it, lobbying it to Paul first, do you want to just give us an overview of the cyber threat landscape that you say day to day for micro and SME business in, in this territory in the UK that you're working on, Paul? So, yes, uh, thank you. The, the <coughs> issues we're seeing at the moment are um, businesses adopting what we call like a best practice, that first run um, on, on, on the ladder um, and getting them, them to understand, business to understand why it's important that we need to adopt this, this kind of foundation level uh, of security. Um, I often have discussions with business owners and managers who aren't technical. Um, obviously, I know the technical space because I've come back from a, a, my, my background in my corporate days as company CISO for a pan-European space company. So I've got a unique position where I can talk technical to technical, but also non-technical to non-technical people, which come, often helps when I'm trying to explain the cyber risks and, and potential pitfalls to businesses who think that they're not a target, they're only small. And I say, well, that's great, but you advertise the fact that you do some work with bigger companies who might be a target for, for the threat actors. So we need to do three things well, and it's the basic three things. And it's, it's, if we can do these, we're already adding that layer of security to your business to make you a harder nut to crack. Um, and in essence, that what we're, that's what we're trying to do here. So the first one is um, putting on multi-factor authentication on for um, as many as your products online as possible. So things like your email, CRM system, uh, and online portals. It tends to be a free layer, so it's a, it's a bit of a, a quick win, really, as, if you will. But so many businesses still don't do that because they see it as an additional step. It takes me longer to do what I need to do. So we tend to have discussions around, okay, but we need to shift your mindset. You don't mind when you leave your house to lock your door, not once, not twice, but maybe three times because you've got a lock at the top at the middle and at the bottom as well. So when you come back from having a full day in the office and you're quite tired, you don't bemoan unlocking the door three times before you can open it because you know why you do that. So it's an educational piece, really. We're trying to educate businesses on why they need to be looking at doing this stuff. I think you're on mute there, Pete. Yeah, well done. Sorry, it's because I was coughing up myself on mute. Okay. Um, so, 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 Steve, obviously the, the idea and what we're interested to look at here is see what the threat position looks like. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, most of us, if not all of us, the rest of us are based in the UK. Um, so we're, we're reasonably familiar with some of the actual threats coming at us. Um, and we'll get more to that later. But I'm interested from your end, Steve, over in Johannesburg, what, what are you, you know, when you look at micros and SMEs surrounding you at the moment, perhaps paint a picture of us, what they are, what they look like, and what the threat access is that they're seeing, and what, what it is that Wolfpack Risk is is thinking that it needs to communicate and, 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 and help these guys with. Yeah, well, as you probably know, Pete, uh, through Wolfpack, we do have a, an organization called Alert Africa, which... Uh, was founded a number of years ago out of a seed fund from the UK, from the British Council here. So a lot of our uh, work with SMMEs runs through Alert Africa, which is designed for small businesses, even schools, where they can come online and get information from us, uh, cyber training, et cetera, advice, and also uh, cyber bullying, counseling, and all that sort of thing. Um, if I look at sort of trends, there's, there's, there's sort of five main areas i would say where we've seen a lot of activity um and i'll talk a bit more about that on the second question uh, one area is social engineering a lot of things going on in that area where, with, with attacks coming through emails etc social media scams things like that um a lot of these being successful as well incidentally and a lot of people unfortunately only contacting us you know after it's happened um, so that's quite prevalent at the moment. Also, um, accounts being hacked as well has been a big area of people uh, having their accounts logged into and all sorts of things happening to their accounts because of it. Uh, some people losing a lot of money, etc. Uh, that's, uh, that's sort of second on the list, I would say, for us. 
uh, it's a bit different to the business profile from the you know the normal business we deal with because we don't just deal with SMEs as you know but so I'm, I'm giving you from that view um, in Africa you may know already there's a lot of scams that go on uh, a lot of them come outside of South Africa uh, from other African countries uh, as well one of those is investment scams um, and we try and educate people on those because the, the, I get one virtually every day an investment scam you know and I've got everything I need on my laptop to protect me but they still somehow get through so that's an area we've been working on a lot recently and just general scams not just investment scams but other types of scams you know via even via mobile etc those sort of things those are sort of the top five we come across and also what's interesting um, a lot of them happen because people play around and they click on things that they weren't aware of uh, you know, as a distraction in a sense. So it actually, actual fact is accidentally uh, <laughs> uh, doing something that links them to something that actually causes an issue with them from a, from a cyber perspective. So uh, those are the sort of areas we're working with SMEs a lot and trying to educate them, you know, with their staff. I mean, some of your other questions relate to some of the things that we put in place further on with smaller companies, what we suggest. But generally speaking, that's the main trends we're seeing. Uh, threats we're seeing at the moment from from uh, that perspective and a question to both of you um how has that changed obviously pandemic and we know the world has changed a lot of the pandemic um how how do you see a big difference between what you were looking at in 2019 and what no. you're looking at in 22 yeah for, for sure yeah especially here if i can speak um right now i mean if you look at the statistics because I, I look at it a lot We've still got 55 to 60 percent of people working from home in South Africa. Uh, in fact, most people don't want to go back to work. And um, we've even had cases where companies have threatened them and it's gone to court and they've lost the case. So because of that, the, uh, the social engineering element has crept up dramatically to in the area of about 66 percent of what we're hearing about uh, through people working from home is the social engineering threat. So that's changed. It's, it's gone up quite a bit. Uh, because of the pandemic and it hasn't gone down because of the fact that in in South Africa people like working from home now they've got used to it and it's very difficult to get them back so <laughs> in fact yeah. most of my clients work from home so Paul, um, Paul, so that's how, interesting. How, Paul how do you see that in the UK um, it's interesting actually because it's I think it, it slightly mirrors what Steve said there as well I don't know any sort of legal cases personally that I've come across yet but um, definitely we're seeing a big influx in, in the workforce now requesting uh, numbers of days that they work from home for um, and, and turning down job offers or moving away from their current employment because they're not able to have this, this flexible approach to working. So there is, there's definitely that as a, as, as a complication, as muddy in the waters, as I say, um, around how we work as a business, how business works, what business looks like now. And, and how we enable this flexible workforce that could be working from different places. We've had remote working around for a while where people could have a laptop and, and go off site and, and remotely connect for a bit. But those were only the sporadic odd occasions or maybe just the sales team, for example, for, for a business or an organization or the, 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 the MD is, is, is moving around quite a lot. And he needs to be able to dial in and connect to his systems wherever he or, or, or she may be. Um, but we're seeing as well during a pandemic, I got a lot of requests from business to go, look, Paul, we're struggling to make make it work here. Um, we need laptops and we need to sort people's home Wi-Fi out because for some reason then they're, they're all struggling now. So there was lots of people using personal home devices to access work information and data. So there's questions around security, um, practice, GDPR, compliance, et cetera, around all of that and how we manage that access and control access to our data. So I think it's what it's done is it's it's coming back full circle now because companies are going to be audited and be checked um, against how they're now working. How have they fared for the last two years, three years? Are they operating as they were expecting or do they need to come back and really now review that with um, a longer sort of mindset? Because I don't know what it was like in South Africa, Steve, but over here in the UK, originally lockdown was going to be two weeks. Uh, in March, and then business was going to carry on sort of afterwards. And as we know, it didn't quite pan out like that. And outside of home working and, and managing that process, are there any other threats that have crept in that, that you've seen coming in, um, or is it really orientated around that staff story? Uh, 
I think as well, the other part with this as well, the other part of the story is the fact that businesses have put more solutions and systems into the cloud. They've adopted the cloud more now, whereas before they were like, oh, yes, it sounds really good, Paul, but we're far too busy. We've got key milestone payments. We've got trained staff. We've got procedures to change. You name it, it was a problem and a blocking point. Then three weeks into a pandemic, when people realize, actually, it's not going to be two weeks. We're going to be here for a bit longer. We need to change how we're working because our workforce is not productive. And we absolutely have to be productive to make sure we've got a business at the end of the day. So I think shifting of focus from email is a prime example. People have moved away from in-house email systems or using third party uh, uh, web hosted email accounts to using more things like Google Workspace and Microsoft 365. That also needs securing and setting up correctly. Has that happened? You, there's options. Why it's an option, I don't really know. It should be on by default, and that's that's how it is. But things around two-factor authentication, using a secondary device to to validate you are who you say you are before you get access, um, for me should be should be, should mm. be um, on there by default. But it's all about setting these things up and understanding what the risk is to your business. What information are you putting into that online portal? And Steve, does that do you relate to that? I mean, outside of the social engineering, the working from home, do those same threats um, come? Uh, and also, I'm interested. Do you have a feel on where the where the threat vector is coming from? So, do you are you are you seeing South Africa uh, African attacks on African businesses, or are you seeing it come in, you know, from other countries as well? It's coming from both countries, um, and I think uh, what, what's interesting about that, of course, is the fact that. A lot of our clients that I deal with, there they've been, you know, we've been, we've been doing teleworking policies and stuff like that for working from home, and I've done quite a few of them already for large and small. Um, and from what uh, I was hearing, what Paul was saying, um, a lot of our clients now, even SMEs, are using VPNs, um, you know, for access, and of course MFA. I know you mentioned MFA earlier, and that's something I'm seeing coming in a lot more. Uh, wherever we're working now is people actually starting to use MFA and realizing the importance of it. So, but no, there's no real, there's no real comparison, Pete. It's, it's local and international. Um, and even uh, outside in countries like Russia, China, uh, Singapore, I mean, uh, all over the place. So uh, some of the major ones we've had here, the major data breaches we've had here recently, have been have been quite huge. I mean, um, one of my clients was affected by the TransUnion one as well. So uh, they're ongoing here, and I think we're getting more and more and more of them here. Uh, every week we hear of another one. I mean, uh, that's happened. So I think mm. as well, uh, building on from that there, Steve, as well is the the, the way that the beforehand it used to be uh, groups of of people in hoodies in dark rooms with the cyber yeah. so criminals, and they were programmers and coders and stuff. Now that's not the case. You can buy this as a service. So mm. it's, it's set up as a business. So if you have a disgruntled employee, uh, it's possible now for these people to, to tap into this resource and actually pay uh, a fee to get hold of the tools and the systems they need, as well as the accounts, to get back mm. at their, at potentially at their employer, which is spooky and scary. But it goes on from that again. If they can't quite work out what they need to do, there's a help desk. They can log a ticket. And request support from the company to help them get back at their whoever it is they're targeting so mm. in terms of the, the who it's not as clear cut as it used to be where it was high tech it was aimed at uh cyber criminals who who've been doing this since they were teenagers or have had numerous years experience in coding and programming and and the rest of it it's now shifted it's now it's now a business entity on its own so so let me just ask you guys just um reasonably sharply we've not got a lot of time left to play with in a, in a sentence or two what's your take on cyber insurance as a response for business to this stuff um steve you go first i'm waiting for that one um we, we do a lot of assessments at clients in fact I've, I've been doing one in cape town recently at a, a very well-known large company um, and the reason they did it was because they've had a cyber insurance audit and they, they've got uh, bad findings and, uh, you know, they've threatened them. So, <laughs> so a lot of our work is actually doing remediation in companies, small and large, because of cyber insurance and not, either not having it or not having enough. So it is important. You know, yeah. two ways about it, particularly now, particularly with GDPR and uh, in South Africa, POPIA, you know, with Popia here, I think I've mentioned on meetings before, you know, you can get up to a 10 million rand fine, which is nowhere near as much as the euros, obviously, in GDPR. 
but you can also go to prison here as well, whereas on GDPR yeah. not necessarily. So <laughs> there's a major fear factor around data privacy, uh, and a lot of my work is involved in in, uh, in GDPR and the extension controls of 22701 mm -hmm. and linking and process mapping and all those things around that. So that all relates back to what the findings are that we're getting on the reports for for cyber insurance. So we're doing and, a lot of work in that area. And Paul, in the last uh, sorry. Oh, Paul, I mean, I'm sorry, sorry to cut you off, but we really are we're wrapping up against time. Um, Paul, what's your take on cyber insurance? Um, I think it's like most things. It's not one size fits all. So what is really important is to understand and listen to the business itself. It needs to understand what's its risk. Why are you talking about cyber insurance? What is it you're trying to reduce or mitigate with that? It's the same as, as any other insurance. What is the purpose of you doing it? You, you need to understand your why and what your risks are so you can effectively mitigate them correctly. So I think as long as you do that, then it's the right thing. If you're looking at it as a bulletproof solution, so if you get hit with ransomware, uh, you've got to get our jail card. That's probably not really the right mindset to be going into it with. Mm. And just, um, I, I want to make room maybe for a minute of questions on the end of this. So um, just one other thing from me, um, looking forward over the next three years, what do you see as the, the threats that are coming down the line, the things that we as the, the business community need to be thinking about and focused on? Paul, you pick up on that first. I think it's the three the three basics. It's still going to be the three basics because the, uh, it's been get, get this way for the last five or six years at least. So good password hygiene, not using the same passwords and using a vault, patching of your endpoints, making sure your computers are, are patched and updated, and the software you use is patched and updated. And so the, the, last, the last one is um, uh, phishing emails, looking after your email environment. Yeah, so those are the actions. What are the threats? What are we seeing coming? Is it the same as? Um, I think so. I think there's going to be an increase potentially. I mean, I alerted in my previous uh, comment about uh, it's not it's not organised. Won't necessarily be organised crimes. It could be disgruntled yeah. employees doing this as well. Yeah. Okay. I'm with you, Steve. What's your take? Well, every year at Wolfpack we do a cyber sort of assessment for the year. We do a landscape view for the you know for the following year, and we also speak to our clients and uh, we do some of our own research. So if you look at the top four we had. The one that came out the most was the risk against your reputation as a business. Okay. Business owners are extremely worried about losing reputation when something goes wrong, uh, and in fact, losing clients. Uh, data breaches resulting in uh, physical or financial harm, which sort of links to that first one in a sense. Uh, one of my clients at the moment, you know, they've, got, they've got a cloud software product that they have customers using, which they hand over to the client to use, and they sort of help them uh, from configuration point of view. But it's the client software. It doesn't belong to the people who sell it. Once they sell it, they hand it over, but they, they're also at risk yeah. if something goes wrong. <laughs> Brilliant. That's a big one. Uh, Guy, cyber guys, on sorry. Supply chain, third one, one more. Supply uh, chain, cyber yeah. attack on supply chain. So third-party yeah. risk is growing and growing and growing. Yeah. Uh, that's what we're seeing. People who can come into your system processing data on your behalf, that type of thing. Also a big one we're seeing here. Okay. So, guys... Thank you for that. We, we are up and, uh, and out against time. What, one thing I draw from all of that, it's really interesting to hear that I, I think the, the, the profiles of risk and things between the UK and South Africa, you know, they're going to have their nuances and, and how, how communities work, but it's a, it's a similar profile of risk that we're seeing. So I'm going to take a liberty and just say, if we got just one or maybe two questions, if anybody wants to put their hands up, we're, I'm up against time, so I'm not looking for it. Leslie, you kick off. Yeah, one of the things that concerns me is that, as you said, Steve, was third-party consultants not having the same software or security mm. requirements as you, as you do mm. internally in the company, like mm. the 2FA, uh, VPN connections, etc. For me, that, mm. that is a big concern when many companies use consultants. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're busy at the moment with, a, um, with actually dealing with that, one of the major clients of, uh, who produce alcohol across the world. I won't mention who they are. But they have uh, got a big problem with their suppliers because some of their global suppliers that they utilize, they can't do without them. So even though you do a third-party evaluation, uh, the problem they've got is they off-board a, a supplier, they can't get anybody else straight away. So Brilliant. it's a double-edged sword. It's a double-edged sword. Yeah? One more Just quick depends. question from anywhere. 
Oh, no. OK, good. Well, well, we'll have a time a bit later in the meeting to come back for a more general discussion if we want. But Steve, Paul, thank you for that. That was a really interesting cross section across what's going on. Um, do connect with Steve, Paul. I'm sure they'll all work to connect with you. It'd be great to see that dialogue roll forward.